for Iowa Association for Education of Young Children. Um, but I also, on my own, I've just collected a lot of experience. Um, so that's part of just my own knowledge. So tap into someone you know if you don't have your own personal experience. Um, tap into people who have experience. Um, but also there's this website that I like to um, check with that's called kidsgardening.org and they have a lot of resources. They also have grants um, that I am considering applying to. And you know, just the internet is a great resource too. Um, but yeah, those are a few um, that I have tapped to do the local ones for Iowa, particularly. Yeah, I would say at, a, at the school level, I would think like getting involved with the FFA, like depending, I was obviously in a rural school district, so uh, FFA was really big, so ag clubs. I also worked a lot with the science teachers. That was really helpful, especially with that sustainability piece since I knew that I was going to after two years so they actually their high school in El Cater they have a composting program with the school lunch program and that was all student-led so that was really helpful luckily the school it's K through 12 so we were able to use high schoolers to really help with a lot of the things like that that maybe be a little bit harder with elementary kids and the high schoolers have a little bit more flexibility in their days so definitely I would think like look for those resources in your school or community, things like that, definitely families, parents. And then there's, at least on the money piece, there's always so many grants that are available. I know like Whole Foods does a grant, there's so many. And like you could ask Molly for that, I'm sure she would know or anybody here would have a lot of access to that. Can you bring that? Or the document up, I think says. So. Um, so, um, they covered a, a lot of good uh, resources already. Um, I'm going to bring up a document that I worked on that put together some of the school gardens that we worked on that you're free to use. Um, definitely talk to your grounds crew if you haven't. Um, ben Grimm is in Iowa City. How many of you guys are from other than Iowa City here? Okay, so quite a few guys. Um, so, there's just things you don't know about the campuses that you're looking at that you absolutely have to know before you start even thinking about school garden, and they can be a really great resource for that. Um, and they can also, I would go look at other school gardens and just see what they look like and ask the grounds crew which one they think is the easiest to maintain. Because if you can, if you do raise beds, if you do them a certain way with the part, they can go around and, and um, it can reduce your maintenance a lot. So that would be, um, and then we, so in the document I'll bring up, we, we have an outline, outline for doing a visioning session. Like I really, like with Southeast Junior High, which is on here, we got together with science teachers and, and kids and asked them, what is it you're looking for in a school garden? Like it's a great wintertime activity, like January or February. And we have a list of different, um, you might have been scrolled through it. Yeah. It won't take too much time here. My answer will make more sense in the course of this. So on the front here, this is the outdoor edible classroom at downtown Iowa City Rec Center. If you haven't been there, go check that out. I'm a big supporter of raised beds, lower, much lower maintenance, more, more easily maintained, much harder for them to plow under, um, much more aesthetically pleasing when they're close to a building. This is, these are beds out at School of the Wild. That's another place that we put in gardens. So this is an outline of the design process. So this is a free publication that you guys are all welcome to get on the website that Michelle will have our link um, to the Backyard Abundance website. So it's a lot of text, but types of questions to consider when you're designing. Um, and then there's some example designs. And again, a lot of small text, but we have an outline of this, and then each number it corresponds with a design goal on the left-hand side as to what area will be used. For example, when we design this garden, we imagine we have a big crowd of kids, and this is the shady teaching area, and so we designed so the teacher could easily lead them back to that shady teaching area. And then these had certain purposes, These have, this area had certain purposes. So just thinking your garden through has resources on that. Um, this is another eye chart. This is related to the science curriculum. I'll talk about that in another um, question. 
Um, and then here's a couple examples of, this is a really small school garden that's at the very front of the school where parents typically wait for their kids um, that we designed around a science curriculum and we have information on costs to the, if you were gonna implement it. Um, this is at Southeast Junior High here in Iowa City. This garden is non-existent right now because they're adding on an addition, but it's gonna be put back in, so that stuff can happen. Um, but one of the things I would say that was interesting about the Southeast Junior High, we thought we wanted to put in a garden that would support science curriculum, and what we found out is kids really needed wanted a place to go during study hall and that the teachers approved of that and a place for them to go do their homework outside in kind of a quiet, almost meditation area. And so that was something if we wouldn't have really asked the kids and um, the teachers, if that wouldn't have been included. <coughs> More materials was, oops, sorry guys. And then, then there's some designs of, this is the outdoor downtown classroom. And then this is a simple in garden bed if you wanna mix food and like, pollinators. So um, if that is a helpful resource, then please use it. Resource, what resources do you have there? I tend to use the community resources. So any of the, um, like, let's see, already, backyard abundance, Trees Forever, the Prairie Preview that Borough of Land Trust puts on. So this is all networking places that I, I begin to develop relationships with people and find out what they do, what their expertise is, and we have invited people in from meeting those, um, at those venues. Also, there are other people that are doing similar things. So they'll be able to uh, assist in uh, connecting you with, with things that you need. A lot of, of what I find is telling people what you need, talking to the principal, you know, letting them know if you're having difficulty with anything, asking them what, what, they, what you need, and also asking them what they feel that they want the garden to accomplish as it's an ongoing garden. This isn't the actual development, this is actually as it's going on, and uh, you need some feedback sometimes from the teachers and the, and the principal. If you're meeting their expectations of what they want the garden to do. For other resources, materials and that, we tend to get uh, wood chips from a local arborist as they're cutting down trees in the neighborhood. They will dump it for free so they don't have to take it to the landfill. Um, we get assistance in collecting la um, compost from the landfill. Uh, what else? Uh, there's a, there are pictures on the back table and, and that will, when I talk about the tree trunks that we've used for the circle classroom, um, they came from a, uh, a, a guy that does kiln dried wood. So he has a huge collection of wood that he's working on you know, and I gave him the specifications of what I wanted for the seating, and he was able to do that for us at a, a very reasonable right, rate. The, the price he quoted was for um, firewood, basically. So it was a lot easier for him, and he actually, because of my specification was four to six foot lengths, and, and what he ended up cutting, they were, I think, 14, 14 foot long and weighed a packet. There was no way we could have physically man managed to move them. And I must have shown in my expression when I saw them that this was going to be pretty impossible for us to deal with. And um, he actually, uh, after that reaction, he said that he would uh, deliver it for us. Well, the first question he had was, do you want me to cut them shorter? to the links that I requested. They were such gorgeous long pieces and some of them even curved into the, to help with the, the circle. I said no, but the, I have no way to move them. And then he offered to, uh, to help move it as well. So I tend to depend a lot on local, local people, local assistants, uh, people that have met through Jen and Backyard Abundance. Um, Hi, Hi, does uh, really good for assisting with, with 
grants for funding things? Free plants. And free plants, yeah. Free plants. Into the season, you can get, definitely you need to have a little bit of scavenger blood in you. Um, for looking out for sales, looking out for things that are on the uh, curbside on uh, Mayor's Day in Coralville, things that get thrown away, uh, things that people don't need. I canvassed the area in the fall, and uh, this year I've collected over 60 bags of leaves that we compost, we actually compost on site. And we probably will be composting uh, at least half of the compost that we use in the garden this next year. But it does take a little bit of, you know, effort. But it, it's, it's so cool to see the kids' reaction when the compost piles are filled to rounded tops, and then after the winter and the springtime, they see it's down to half, and they know, you know, how much went into it because they helped fill them, and those are actually going to be, uh, it's going to be soil that goes into the, the, the beds and gets stuck in and grows the plants. And the other thing that we're helping them to understand that the plants don't actually eat compost. This is not part of the cycle for plants. So there's some, there has to be something else in the soil, the microorganisms that are actually degrading the compost even more and providing for the plants the essential elements that they need. So you have to have a healthy soil, you have to have that living soil, you have to have the microorganisms in the soil um, to grow good plants. Part of that is uh, the compost, part of it is not tilling, we don't till, we don't spray. Um, we just try and distribute as little as possible. A lot of really great resources. I especially liked hearing and a couple of you commented on. Look to organizations that already exist in the community or clubs that are already successful at the school and really try to have your garden be supporting those to create sustainability and um, buy-in. I love that idea. Um, in uh, looking to, uh, I know Cassie met, mentioned um, partnering with a science teacher. Um, I'd love to hear how each of you approaches the integration of school gardens into the broader school community. So for example, connecting the garden to uh, core curriculum or lessons or leveraging school gardens um, toward the end of creating a school-wide culture of health. <laughs> um, so a few things that I have done in my classroom um, and that is a school-wide event is we do mentor families. So every grade has a mentor family that's another grade. So we're crossing the grades and they get experience with seeing other faces that are little and not adult faces and they get to have those interactions. So with the mentor families that my preschoolers have were with the first and second graders. And so we actually last year started all of our seeds and that was, we just had these, I went to a seed workshop class and she gave us seeds and these little pods, um, peat moss pods, and we just started seeds with the mentors, and all the kids did was just po poke a little seed in. Um, and so that's how we're getting that cross um, school education and growing the interest and having hands-on experiences. Um, I've also started a, um, the first year I was part of the grant, um, I did a weekly um, gardening class, and now the, the preschool specials have grown, and so now it's a bi-weekly class because um, we just can't fit everything in. Um, but in that class, we not only talk about gardens and what it takes to grow a garden and what is in a garden, but we talk about food and the food that is grown in a garden. Um, and so I will bring in just something for them to taste test, and we will do taste testing samples, and we'll learn about the different shapes of seeds, and we'll... Um, one of the successes that we had was um, I bought an indoor garden space, which is where we started the seeds, um, but we planted carrots in the the beds for, the container beds for um, this, 
garden, indoor garden space are only a few inches deep. So I found carrots that are about the size of a ping pong ball when they're fully grown. And so the kids got to plant the seeds and watch them grow and water them. And then in a few weeks after Christmas break, they got to pull their own carrot out and eat it. And they were so excited about it. And so finding things that you can do in your classroom, it doesn't have to always be outside in an outdoor space. Um, and that is something that I found tremendous success with. Uh, and having them, like we did microgreens one year, or one after we grew the carrots, we grew microgreens and we've grown arugula and things you can do indoors that um, really get them excited. They get to see that transition is um, how I've done it with the kids that I've worked with. Yeah, so I've been a little bit, kind of the school gardening has sort of been a sidetrack for me as I was going and getting my license, but I've certainly spent a ton of time with standards. Um, I guess one thing I would say again, if you're a teacher, I would say partner with other teachers. Come up with some sort of committee so that you can look over your priority standards for your school um, and what you need to be hitting. And then the amazing thing is, is almost everything's on Google. Like all of these curriculums are already out there. They're, I know that they're, would it be ISU? I know that we have some Iowa that's matched with the Iowa standards. Mm -hmm. And then Minnesota also has really great resources too that align with their state standards, which are obviously pretty similar to ours. So the amazing thing is that it's pretty much all out there. You just have to figure out at your school how to kind of get some sort of committee started, or if you're not in a school, figure out how to bring in those teachers and figure out what standards they need to be hitting. And then you just work and implement, and you're gonna have trial and error The, as I showed you in that other um, document, one of my focuses was working with the science curriculum, which is called FOSS. How many of you, who has not heard of FOSS out there? Okay, a few of you, okay. I, I don't wanna like, I mean, basically it's just a standard science curriculum that most of Iowa uses, right? So each year, um, typically in grades K through six, there's a physical science unit, there's an earth science unit, and a life science unit, and so, Using the grant, I kind of went through all 18 curriculums, so three per grade times, or I guess that would be, there's seven grades with K, so it's 21 curriculums, and tried to like figure out where are they already doing stuff we can do outside in the garden, and so that eye chart I showed you, this big spreadsheet, that, that is mapping that. So if you have a teacher who says, I'm a third grade teacher, and I want to teach them this life science stuff out in the garden, then, then you could look in that and see, okay, what would you type? teach about bean plants or looking at seeds, these are things you can do outside. So I did that whole project, and so I'm, that was my approach, and to be honest, I don't know that the school system is ready to support that from a global, um, what am I trying to say, like, it still takes a person to train the teachers how to teach outside and how to map that together to make it implement. And so as I hear these other ideas, I do think you can have a quicker, more satisfying impact growing in really small gardens in the classroom probably um, sometimes. And so you just have to think about, um, you know, what what is you know what's your goal and the person who's going to be running it. What what's their inspiration? What you know what what's their passion? And and because I find the teachers, if I say come outside, let me give you an experience, they're always ready, right? Um, but you have to. It's it's the preparation that's that takes the time. I was always talking to t teachers trying to get them involved and wondering why they weren't getting involved. So I went to a staff meeting and give, gave them a little bit of a pep talk about what we can do, what I was willing to help them with, and I asked for some input. What would, it, what would it take for them to take their classes outside? And one of the things that came out of that was, well, can you make us a map? We, we really don't know what is what out there and what we could, you know, what we could pull, what we could you know, work with, what were the beds, what were the paths. So I made a, a map for them. And what grew out of that, and it, it, there's some copies at the back if you want to have a look at it, it's easier to see. 
Um, that was last year, and I created some new bids because I was hoping that we'd get more involvement from most of the most of the students that are in the after school program are kindergarten to fourth grade. So I was trying to capture those a little bit more, but besides just the ones that come to the garden club. And so I opened up those new beds, offering to each grade level to plan to bid. So I sent out a, a little sheet saying, these are the sizes of the beds, these are the, si the kinds of thing things that we could plant. Choose three, each grade, choose three plants, and I'll try and give you one of your three choices, but we're gonna vary it as much as we possibly can so that it, there's a wide variety of vegetables for everybody, that everybody gets to cultivate, everybody gets to eat everything um, and share in, in the bounty. And that was the first year last year, and, and the first graders were the only ones that responded, but they were really enthusiastic. They wanted to plant tomatoes, duh. <laughs> they wanted to plant lettuce and hot peppers. <laughs> Who would have guessed that you know, first graders would have wanted to plant hot peppers. So there are three first grade classes. Each grade, grade came out and planted a bed, and they got all three choices that they wanted to plant. And we planted the other beds with other things, but it kind of started that momentum, and I think this coming year, this coming spring, we'll probably have more responses. So I'm really looking forward to that, to engage them a little bit more so that uh, maybe during a recess, once a month, once a week, every two weeks, however, to kind of figure out that we could do it, what would be adequate, that they can actually do a little bit of work in the garden too for a short period of time. So there's a rotation of, of what's going on. So that was a really cool thing that I would never <coughs> have imagined to do, to make them a map, explain where the beds were, what kinds of beds they were. We have a, a pie shape that we've divided in four, so it's to teach rotation. <clears throat> and all of those are keyhole beds, so you can easily access each pie piece really easily. Um, and so they now know where those are. They know where the composting is, they know where the water is, they know where the tools are, they know which beds are which. And uh, we used to concentrate a lot on perennials. So there are certain perennial beds that then they know that they can go out and they can harvest from those anytime. Um, and they're actually beginning to use the garden. One of the fifth grade classes came out and totally unexpected. I happened to be there, but they came out un, unannounced and they were coming out for one of their observation classes. So they were coming out to observe things in the garden and then they went back and reported what they had seen. So I was elated you know, that this was at last, you know, eight years. Finally, finally coming together. <laughs> you have great patience, Joyce. Um, I have a handful of questions left, but I think only time for one more. So um, I'm gonna squish two of them together. I'm gonna cheat a little bit. Um, everyone's m mentioned uh, one or everybody's m mentioned a few barriers uh, when it comes to school gardens and integrating those into our local school districts. Um, I'm curious what what you all think uh, for how how policy at the local or state level can help support um, institutionalizing school gardens. And then in two sentences, if you want to say your you know dreams or vision for uh, your school garden in the future. And I know that'll make it really <laughs> brief, but yeah, we just have about five more minutes. Super chat. Policy and then your vision for the future. I'm not too sure about the policy, but what I would really like to see, uh, and what I envision is because of the, I guess because of the amount of work that I put in, that I realize for this to be really successful, the school has to take it seriously. They have to change the name and give it a new image, and they also have to have part of the criteria for one of, at least one of the staff members on their um, job, description. job description is going to be the 
garden advisor. That is, their, that is their job description, part of it. And I know this is hard. Um, I have talked to some of the parents, and I know the parents just work their hearts out. But they might be able to combine some of their para work with some of the garden work. But it has to be considered part of the educational experience. This is not something extracurricular. This is part of the garden learning. This is life lessons we're learning. It's not just playing in the dirt. It's not just naming worms. It's really significant in our development, in our health, um, in our approach to life, in our value system. We value the earth, we value uh, the rights of nature instead of the corporate rights for you know leveling any garden that exists because we're going to build something on top of it. about what you said about it's it's important the values and respecting the land and our environment because we need to care about our environment and so we need to implement ways that we are teaching our children and how to care for our environment um, and ourselves um, and <clears throat> I think policy someone there needs to be m more people who are involved and it's not just an extracurricular activity I wholeheartedly agree with that um, I don't have much about policy necessarily. I, the school I work at is a private school, so we fall under, you know, we don't have a lot of the same guidelines that um, public schools do um, in some ways. And so we're pretty fortunate to be able to um, kind of make up what, how we want to implement these things as long as they're still hitting certain notches that are just broad educational um, marks. Uh, and you said something about no, just your vision. vision yeah, vision. Sure. Okay, thank you. Um, so my vision in an ideal world would be every school would have an opportunity to have a garden. If that school doesn't want to, that's fine. But I think n having that option is really important and having someone who is in charge of that garden um, because that's how you're going to find success when you're implementing school gardens or outdoor learning spaces. Um, just the opportunity to do that and someone who is in charge of that. And when you have success, then that's how you get the ball rolling, and you know it becomes contagious, like you said. Yeah, totally. Um, on policy, obviously, I, again, I'm not as in it as I used to be when I was an AmeriCorps Corps Corps member. I was more involved in like what the Iowa laws were, and so I guess I don't even remember all the different barriers. But obviously, there are barriers to serving local food or like having a school garden and kids being able to eat the food. Can food can it go in the lunch line um, but then also teacher autonomy is a really big thing so I guess policy on that side teachers are under a lot of stress and have to follow a lot of guidelines and depending on the school you have to follow a curriculum um, so that obviously is a huge barrier and just like letting teachers teach and want to do the things that they know are good for their kids so Oh, vision? Sorry, I didn't do a vision. I guess, yes. <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to bring it back up. <laughs> um, I, so in the summers, I get to work with Taproot, which is so amazing, but it's also not completely realistic, as in, like, not all kids get that experience. So I think, like, taking what we do at Taproot, which is essentially just letting kids be outside in nature and being able to implement that into public school. So having those outdoor classroom areas where you have, like, benches, you've got sensory gardens, and you have just this entire area where these kids can be outside. And although there's different classroom management issues when kids are outside, it's also like a lot of the little behaviors that you see inside four walls, you don't see outside. I think Joyce is really onto something with para, like a quarter time para per school. I mean, I think that's all it would take. Gardeners are pretty resourceful. Um, and, you know, I always try to compare these outdoor learning environments or gardens to a library or the computer lab. We don't expect volunteers to do this, you know, begging for chips from, you know, the arborist. So um, we have to decide that this is important. Um, so in the past, my, as far as vision goes, I, I came at this a lot from science curriculum integration, but I think my 
I think this is a public health crisis now. I think, um, I really do. And as a functional, like working in functional medicine and working with Dr. Terry Walls, if any of you guys have heard of her in town, I mean, we, our, our microbiomes, our bodies, we evolved as humans interacting with the dirt, and that's where we got this healthy bacteria that we're all now taking in capsules called probiotics. We got them from the dirt, and they actually, where the science is going now, like the capsules we're buying don't do as well, like forming colonies, healthy digestion, as if we get, if we eat tablespoons of healthy soil. So by, we're so disconnected, all the obesity problems and these um, attention deficit problems. I mean, our microbiome, almost more neurotransmitters are created there than in our brain. So this is like, this is like a major public health policy in my mind. And I don't know how to solve that from a policy level, but um, we can't pretend like sanitizing our kids and keeping them indoors all the time, um, chained to their chairs. And, I, and teachers are, are incredibly resourceful and all that. So I have a lot, I can't believe the things my Iowa City school teachers do to help my kids, but yes, they deserve to have this as a resource. You all said, I don't know a lot about policy and then had really good ideas <laughs> for either a way to look at policy or yeah, actual things that could change to support school gardens. Thank you for taking your time and sharing your expertise with me and everybody here. And um, we're just gonna take maybe five minutes to, for the next group to get ready and um, then we will start our last session of the workshop.